Welcome, friends. Welcome to our study of the Holy Scriptures and to another study that we've been announcing that we would begin today, and that is the doctrine of Calvinism. John Calvin was a great teacher and one that had much understanding as far as the Scripture is concerned. He took a doctrine that was uh, being taught generally among uh, the nations, and he polished it, and from it developed five points that essentially embraced the teaching of uh, Calvinism. These five points are called the matter of total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and uh, perseverance of the saints. In the weeks to come, there will be five of these lessons, including today's. We'll be discussing the measure of these points, every one of them. But as we look at this doctrine, we find that the first point is that that is defined generally as total depravity. The more lengthy name for it is hereditary total depravity. Now, what do this long definition mean? Look at each other word. Hereditary means something that one inherits. The word total means complete, leaving nothing out. And depravity means wickedness, depraved. And the doctrine simply means that when a child is conceived, that because he is man, therefore he is a descendant of Adam, and he inherits the natures of Adam, and that he inherits the corrupt nature as men view it of Adam. And because he is corrupt, he is himself guilty of the sin that Adam was guilty of. And as we look at this doctrine, we find that it was something that was that that was embraced and accepted by the vast majority of people. And out of it grew another doctrine, and that was the doctrine of a baptizing, sprinkling, if you please, of infants. Because it was generally believed at that time and it was close to the first century, the doctrine that Jesus taught, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Of what Peter said on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, and wash you, uh, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. And what Ananias told Paul, oh, why tarriest thou? Rise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. Baptism is for remission of sin. And if a babe is a sinner, then the reasoning was by these teachers and so-called scholars was that if the babe is a sinner, then he needs to be baptized or he's going to be lost or remain in a lost state because they understood the Scriptures taught that one must be baptized to be saved. Now, in the centuries that have passed, the world that had accepted at one time the fact that a babe is born in sin rejected that. But multitudes of them still practice the matter of infant baptism. And that is a strange paradox because infant baptism was deduced because that man taught that a babe was born in sin and he was baptized to remit his sins. Now the world says he's not born in sin, but they continue to baptize him. Why? Well, of course, uh, according to their doctrine, they don't baptize to save him, and they are ill-prepared to try to explain why that they continue a practice uh, that was uh, begun because of the matter that their doctrine was that men are all born in sin. When we look at this position, we find that in the truth is, is that yes, there is a way in which man is as a descendant of Adam affected by Adam's sin. Now we must understand that a man can be affected by Adam's sin and not bear the guilt of the sin. Many children are affected by parents' sins, 
but they are not guilty of the parents' sins. They suffer the consequences of uh, their parents' sins, but they're not guilty of the sin. And so it is, as far as Adam is concerned, we suffer consequences of Adam's sin. And what was that? That sin was, and that consequence was, uh, the sin was violating God's law. And the consequence of Adam's disobedience was that God drove him from the garden, from which was the tree of life. And God drove him from that garden because that uh, were he to take forth his hand and eat of that fruit of uh, the tree of life, he would live forever. When he was separated from the tree of life, his posterity was separated from the tree of life. And because he's mortal, and subject to decay, his descendants are mortal and subject to death and to decay. But that's the only way that man is affected by the sin of Adam. He bears the consequences of Adam's sin. Now, Calvinists use a number of passages of scriptures, but two we want to call attention to. One is from the book of Romans, the fifth chapter. And the other is from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. In Romans, the 5th chapter, the Bible says, By one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin. And so death passed unto all men, for that all men sinned. And there is some question among those that are Bible students as to what kind of death is he talking about. Is he talking about physical death? He's talking about spiritual death. For death is used in the scriptures in both ways. The soul that sins shall die. God told Adam, in the day you eat thereof, you will die. He didn't die physically, but he did die spiritually because death is separation. And he was separated from God. And so the question is then, when a man sins, Adam sinned, and through him death entered the world Death passed unto all men. What kind of death? Is it physical death? I do not believe so. You look at an infant who has done nothing and dies in his innocency. In his infancy, he doesn't die because he has sinned. So that leaves no alternative but the former. That he's talking about spiritual death. But that does not give any comfort or any hope to the Calvinist to present his doctrine and to uphold his doctrine that man dies in sin because of what Adam did. No, notice clearly and carefully the passage. By one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin. Now watch it. And so death, that is spiritual death, passed unto all men. Why? Because Adam said, no, for all men sinned. You see, all men are ones that sin, and therefore they bear the consequences of their sin and the guilt of their sin. Yes, Adam introduced sin into the world, and therefore that was a plague upon mankind. But I don't have to sin. And if a baby is born in this world and he's done nothing, he does not bear the guilt of Adam's sin, but he is in the world, subject to the matters of temptations and all, and he will sin. And when he does sin, as he grows to maturity, he will be separated from God. The other passage is in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. There the Bible said that as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. And again, there are two possible definitions of the word death. Is the kind of death that he's describing in 1 Corinthians 15 chapter physical death? Is it spiritual death? As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. The context of 1 Corinthians 15 has in its mind physical death. And the apostle is seeking to establish from physical death a resurrection. And it was in Adam that we died spiritually, that is... He introduced sin into the world. We sin. We die seriously. And it was in Adam who was separated from the tree of life and his posterity were that we also taste of death, physical. And Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. He arose from the grave and thus 
we share in that. Universally, men suffer the consequences of Adam's transgression. We die, physically. And universally, uh, we are offered redemption and the hope of eternal life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we look, we want to suggest to you there are three reasons why the doctrine of Calvinism cannot be true. First of all, in the book of Ezekiel, in the 18th chapter, in verse 20, the writer said, The soul that sin of it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. This passage specifically and clearly says that the soul that sins shall die. It bears the guilt and the consequences of uh, his own sin. But then he is very specific. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. He is not guilty of the sins that his father commits. Neither is the father guilty of the sin that his son commits. Each man stands to God. And when he sins, he dies. No one else dies spiritually. He dies. That passage in Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, clearly teaches that the infant does not inherit the sin of Adam and thus the guilt and the death spiritually of Adam. But then there is another passage that likewise teaches the same. Not only does the apostle teach in, or the prophet teach in Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, that the soul that sins shall die, but in 1 John, the 3rd chapter, in verse 4, the record said that he that doeth sin doeth lawlessness, and sin is transgression of the law. A child is born in this world without sin. Why? Because not only does Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, say he doesn't inherit sin from his father, but First John 3 and 5 said that sin is transgression of law. And until the child is born into this world, he has violated no law of God. What law of God has the infant still in his mother's room committed? What transgression? What has he done in any way? Nothing. And the soul that sin shall die. But the record says that sin is transgression of the law. But then there is a third passage. In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, the record said that Christ was one that knew no sin. And yet he who knew no sin was made to be sin on our behalf that we might become righteousness of God through him. He knew no sin. My friend, if man sins because Adam sinned, and he is a sinner born one because Adam sinned, and we inherit Adam's corrupt nature. If you will look, the book of Luke tells you that Jesus was the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, and traces his ancestry to David, to Abraham, yes, and traces him to Adam. Jesus was the son of Adam. And if every man that's born in this world is a sinner because his ancestor, Adam, was a sinner, then what's the nature of Christ? He's a sinner too. But the Bible says, him who knew no sin, he made to be sent on our behalf. Now, the Catholics have a good explanation for that, they think. They said, well, Adam, uh, Jesus' mother was immaculate and saved. God halted in her conception, that she should bear the guilt of Adam's sin. Therefore, she didn't pass it on to uh, Jesus Christ. Well, that's a convenient way to get out of a parable circumstance because the Bible says just as much about the immaculate conception of Mary as it does about man being born in sin because Adam was a sinner. Now, I do believe, friend, that Mary was immaculate conceived. I do believe that. But I don't believe that that's something that was peculiar to her. I believe, and the Scriptures teach, 
that that is the universal nature of every babe. Every babe, no matter what the sin of his parents are, no matter how guilty they are, no matter whether he's been conceived in sin or not, that sin is the sin of the parent and is not the sin of the child. So, if men inherit the sin of Adam, Adam, Jesus was a descendant of Adam, then Jesus inherited the sin of Adam as well. But the record said he was sinless. He was sinless as a lamb. He knew no sin. Think of these two passages, my friends. In the book of Matthew, the 18th chapter, Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. For such is the kingdom of God. I've got to be like a child. I've got to be like a child to be in the kingdom. And the nature of God's children in the kingdom is the nature of a child. And the Bible says, except we become like a child, we can in no wise enter the kingdom of God. Matthew 19, I've got to be like a child to enter the kingdom of God. Does that mean that those that are in the kingdom of God are wicked, sinful? Certainly not. I've got to have the disposition of a child. Both these passages teach us that children are ones that are in the kingdom. That is, they have the nature of those that are in the kingdom. Friend, our next lesson we are going to be discussing the doctrine that likewise, in large part, has been rejected by the world, but one time was almost universally held and that is the doctrine of an unconditional election. We invite you to study with us when that lesson is presented next week. Thank you for listening. May God bless you, and may he bless you in your searchings of his scriptures that you might know the truth. Remember, Jesus said, If you abide in my word, then are you truly my disciples, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.